Hello, all you cool cats and kittens. Welcome to episode 8 of Always Time for True Crime. I'm your host, Julia, and today's case is one that was chosen by you guys. I posted a poll on Instagram and Twitter last week with three different options and asked you guys which of the three cases you would most want to see covered. If you missed this poll, I'll be doing them again every so often, so go follow Always Time for True Crime on social media so that you don't miss the next one. So, as requested, today's case is the murder of nine-year-old Amber Hagerman and all that her case has done for missing children around the world. Amber Renee Hagerman was born November 25th, 1986, to parents Donna Whitson, and Richard Hagerman in Arlington, Texas. Donna was just 19 years old when she gave birth to Amber, whereas Amber's father Richard was 36, so he was actually 17 years her senior. The two were in a relationship for most of Amber's life, though they never got married. Amber also had a little brother, Ricky, who was about four years younger than her. They were very, very close. Ricky says Amber was always taking care of him. And not like in the way that their parents didn't take care for him, just in the way that a big sister would. When Amber was about seven or eight years old, her mother decided to leave what she referred to as an abusive relationship and took her two children with her. The three of them lived in a women's shelter for a bit before they then got on welfare. At the same time, Donna, who had dropped out of school after the seventh grade, was working towards finishing all of her high school credits to get her GED. Donna then began taking training courses to become a medical assistant. But even though Donna was super busy with her training and constantly struggling financially, she was still a very dedicated mother to her children. She and her two children always worked as a team. She said Amber was very good at helping set the table on cleanup and just generally helping around the house. Months before Amber's murder, Donna, Ricky, and Amber were actually filming a WFAA documentary for the Dallas-Fort Worth News. The documentary aimed to give a look into the life of a single mother on welfare and bring more awareness to similar issues in the area. One part of the documentary shows Donna struggling to find something affordable to give Amber for her ninth birthday. She mentions that she gets all of her kids' clothes from charity stores and that for Amber's birthday, she wanted to get her something really special. She decided on some Pocahontas bed sheets, which Amber just loved. Amber and her mom were very close. As in the documentary, they called each other best friends, and Donna constantly told the cameras how proud she was of her daughter. She said sometimes she felt guilty that Amber would worry about things a nine-year-old girl shouldn't even have to think about. Amber was just a very mature little girl. Amber was a bit shy, but she loved being a Girl Scout and going to school. She was very proud of her grades and even received an award for perfect attendance, which she showed off to the camera crew while filming the documentary. She also treasured her Barbie doll collection and enjoyed spending time outside with her brother. On January 13, 1996, Donna took the kids to visit her parents, Glenda and Jimmy Whitson. Her parents also lived in Arlington, so Donna would often take the kids over to play. Once they arrived at Donna's parents' house around 3 p.m., the kids immediately grabbed their bikes and asked if they could go play. The two kept their bikes at their grandparents' house because they were there so often, and maybe because it was more of a residential neighborhood from where they lived with their mother. Also, Donna and the kids lived in an apartment, whereas Donna's parents owned a house, so maybe they just had more room to store the bikes there. Anyway, Donna told the children not to go further than down the block, but the kids wanted to go somewhere a little bit further. Amber and Ricky rode to the nearby Winn-Dixie parking lot, just two blocks from their grandparents' home. The spot was an abandoned grocery store parking lot and was a popular square for kids to ride their bikes, as some ramps had even been set up. But minutes after they got there, Ricky was afraid that they might get in trouble for going too far and decided to head back. Amber wanted to stay for a little bit longer. 
So given that it was only two blocks from the house, Ricky pedaled off by himself. However, when he arrived home, his mother wasn't very happy that Amber had gone too far by herself and instructed Ricky to go back and tell Amber it was time to come home. So once again, Ricky rode his bike back to the parking lot, but Amber was nowhere to be found. He turned around and went back to the house where he told his grandpa, Jimmy, that he couldn't find Amber. This time, Grandpa Jimmy decided he would walk over to the parking lot and find Amber himself. When he got to the Winn-Dixie parking lot, Amber's pink bicycle was lying on the ground. From the time that the two kids had left the house to when Jimmy had come back for Amber, only eight minutes had passed. Eight minutes. While Jimmy was still there, police cars started to pull up. Unknown to Amber's family, a neighbor had actually witnessed her abduction and already called police at 3.18 p.m. Jim Cavell was outside on his back deck when he heard a little girl scream. He looked over to see a young girl, who we presume was Amber, being forced into a dark-colored pickup truck, either black or dark blue, by a man. He says Amber put up a fight, kicking and screaming as he put her in the back of his truck. The man was described as white or Hispanic, aged 25 to 40, under 6 feet tall with a medium build. Grandpa Jimmy quickly returned to his house to alert his daughter Donna. Donna remembers her father's face when he came in the door and how he told her what had happened in such a serious tone. She knew this was no joke and that something horrible had happened. FBI were called in to assist in the investigation, and flyers with Amber's picture were handed out all over the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And because Donna, Amber, and Ricky were the subjects of that welfare documentary, WFAA News already had tons of video of Amber. Footage of her at her ninth birthday party, Amber showing the camera crew her school projects, giving a tour of her bedroom. Seeing all this footage really made the public feel more connected to her, and soon, the whole Dallas-Fort Worth area was invested in her safe recovery. A picture of Amber was put out on the front page of the newspaper, and her mother Donna pleaded on TV to have her daughter return safely. The next few days, nobody slept. Not Amber's family, and not the policemen and federal agents who worked hard to try to find the missing girl, but with no luck. Trigger warning for this next part, guys, so if you don't want to hear this part, you can fast forward about a minute or two. On the night of January 17th, a man was out walking his dog super late at night, almost midnight, when he found the body of a little girl in a drainage ditch in the creek behind his apartment, which was only about three miles or just over five kilometers from where Amber was taken. The little girl's throat had been cut, and apart from a sock on the right foot, the body was nude. The man immediately called it in. Police arrived at Donna's apartment at approximately 1 a.m. later that night, or technically now, the morning of the 18th, and notified her that they had found a body, although they had not yet determined for sure that it was Amber. However, the girl was brunette and approximately Amber's age, so I feel like police probably knew it was Amber, but they just couldn't tell Donna until ID was actually confirmed. Donna remembers the agonizing wait to hear more. She and her family hoped and prayed it wasn't Amber, but deep down, she kind of knew it would be. After they confirmed identification through a thumbprint from Amber's school ID badge, police told Donna that she shouldn't see Amber until after the autopsy, once they had had a chance to clean up the body. But Donna wanted to see her daughter right away. Unfortunately, Earlier in the night that Amber's body was discovered, there was a huge rainstorm, which could have possibly washed away evidence. There were also no fingerprints on Amber's bike after she was taken. Investigators believe she could have originally been dumped elsewhere and then moved down the creek by the heavy rainwater, because maintenance workers had been working in the area that day and not seen the body. When the medical examiner reported her finds from the autopsy, it only brought more devastating details of Amber's last days alive. According to the examiner, Amber had been alive for up to 48 hours after she had been abducted. She had been beaten 
and sexually assaulted before her killer slashed her throat and dumped her into the shallow creek. It was the heartbreaking ending that everyone was hoping wouldn't come. After Amber's funeral, condolences from friends and strangers of the community flooded in. Letters, stuffed animals, and other miscellaneous gifts. Donna reportedly received hundreds of stuffed animals at a memorial site for her daughter, which she then donated to the woman's shelter she, Amber, and Ricky had previously lived at. Ceremonies were held at Amber's school and by her fellow Girl Scouts. And while Donna was absolutely brokenhearted over her daughter's brutal murder, she had another child to take care of and be there for. Donna said in the WFA documentary titled After Amber that her five-year-old son Ricky was very confused after Amber's death. He would ask her when she was coming back and if she was at home waiting for him when Donna picked him up from school. Then he sometimes would tell his mom that it was his fault that Amber was gone because he shouldn't have left her alone. It's hard enough to lose a child and take care of yourself and keep on living your life. I can't imagine having to explain it to your young kid and be there and just try to stay strong for him. Over the next few months, police followed every lead they could, but without a murder weapon or any kind of forensics, it was difficult to find this killer. But Donna and the family felt they needed to do something, and if they couldn't help the police find the murderer, they would do their best to make sure this wouldn't happen again to any other family. A group of volunteers, that got smaller by each day, started to petition for longer sentences for those who commit crimes against children. Among this group was Mark Class, the father of Polly Class, who was abducted and murdered from her own home at 12 years old. Her killer, Richard Allen Davis, was convicted for her murder later in 1996. Mr. Class had been a huge leader in the fight for protecting children and is the founder of Class Kids Foundation, which strives to make missing children a media priority. Mr. Class was actually the one to suggest to Richard Hagerman in the days after Amber went missing that they should get the FBI involved in Amber's case. Patsy Day was also part of the group. Her 14-year-old daughter, Jennifer, was murdered in 1985, and up until her own death in 2015, she continued to try to get justice for her daughter, whose killer has never been caught. The group worked in a church office space and quickly founded the organization PASO, People Against Sex Offenders. Amber's dad, Richard, actually quit his job and dedicated his full-time work to the organization. Then, with the help of U.S. Representative Martin Frost, PASO then proposed the Amber Hagerman Child Protection Act of 1996, which was later signed into law by President Bill Clinton. Both of Amber's parents, as well as many other child victims, such as Elizabeth Smart, Jacqueline Maris, and Tamara Brooks, were all present to see the president sign the bill into law. The Amber Hagerman Child Protection Act of 1996, along with Megan's Law and the Jacob Wetterling Act of 1994, created a National Sex Offenders Registry. The Amber Hagerman Protection Act also passed the Two Strikes, You're Out law, which required two-time sex offenders whose victims were children to always be sentenced to life without parole or the death penalty. While this was being passed, Amber's parents, law enforcement, and radio stations were all working with another Dallas mother who came up with a brilliant idea. What if people could receive alerts about a missing child, the same way Texas gave out alerts for tornadoes? That same year, Texas law enforcement linked with local radio stations to launch the Amber Alert program. Amber stood for America's Missing Broadcast Emergency Response and was dedicated to the legacy of Amber Hegerman. At the time in 1996, though, it all had to be done manually. Alerts were faxed over to individual radio stations where they would then broadcast them as soon as they could. Shortly after the Amber Alert program started, it led to the safe finding of a baby girl who was kidnapped by her babysitter. The baby was found safe 90 minutes after the alert went out when someone spotted the car that had been described on the radio. News about this spread all across America, 
and other states began adopting the Amber Alert program as well. Then, in 1998, the Child Alert Foundation created the first automatic alert, which would send alerts not only to all radio stations, but to all television stations, law enforcement agencies, newspapers, and local organizations within a 100-mile radius. In 2002, the Amber Alert system was established nationwide, and by 2005, all 50 states had an Amber Alert system up and running. After the U.S. established a federal system, Canada followed suit, later followed by the United Kingdom, and so on. Today, the Amber Alert system is used in more than 30 countries worldwide, and as of February 2020, 985 children have been rescued specifically because of the American Amber Alert. In 2016, on the 20th anniversary of Amber's kidnapping, Amber's mother, who now goes by Donna Williams, and Arlington Police held a press conference to urge anyone to come forward with any kind of information. They also advertised a $10,000 reward for anyone who provides a tip that leads to an arrest. In 2019, a mural of Amber was painted in her honor near the parking lot she was kidnapped from. It reads, Amber Hagerman, Arlington's Little Angel, alongside a picture of the nine-year-old girl. Police have been through over 8,000 tips on Amber's case, and they still continue to get approximately two or three new tips each month. So, unfortunately, 24 years later, the case remains unsolved. Police say they are confident they'll eventually solve this case, but without forensics or DNA, I would assume the only way to solve it would be if someone confessed. Police have expressed that they don't believe that Amber was his only victim, so my hope is that maybe he's in jail for another crime, and maybe he'll let it slip to one of his inmates. If Amber Hagerman were still alive today, she would be 33 years old. And who knows? Maybe she would be a mother herself. Amber's grandparents, Glenda and Jimmy, have since passed away in the recent years. The rest of Amber's family is still waiting for Amber to finally get some justice. So next time you, or someone you know, gets angry at an Amber alert going off at midnight or being too loud, think of Amber Hagerman. Thanks for listening to another episode of Always Time for True Crime. That one was a little bit short, so I do apologize, but I will be back again next week. If you enjoy these episodes, please give me a review on Apple Podcast and follow me on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Always Time for True Crime. See y'all next week.